chapter 24, verse 36 to 37. Mm -hmm. But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Amen. Okay. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. I guess there was, there was some bulletins because I saw them Wednesday night here at Bible study. But I guess they did get thrown away. So, I guess. Um, there was no title in it because Pastor John and I hadn't talked at that point, so he had already printed them and dropped them off. But if there were to be a title to today's message, it would be, Have You Reached a Verdict? And this is along the lines of, Still, uh, Pastor John, about a month ago, had really felt a burden to be, you know, having messages tied to the second coming. And so he had asked me, and I think he's asked Steve and Frida and others, that for our messages over these next few months to really be touching on the second coming. You know, that maybe we're not giving it the impetus that we should or need to, and so he felt that burden. So he asked me to, you know, um, share a message along those lines, I was like, well, well not a problem, you know, I, and I think that, um, and so what the burden that was kind of laid on me, it, it made me think of, have you ever heard the, the question is like, if you was accused of being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? You, you know, are you living in a way that others would be able to see that you are a Christian? Your language, your habits, your behaviors, your, you know, lifestyle, you know, all the things that go into that, you know, is there enough evidence to convict you? So hence the title, have you reached a verdict? So if someone's watching you, would they reach a verdict that you're a Christian? So now we're going to take that question and, and delve in a little to the next level. Is like, if you were accused of being an Adventist, is there enough evidence to convict you? And the first thing we have to do when we say an Adventist is, are we talking about being necessarily a church member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And I would say, could, that's a narrow definition, but that was never the intent of the people that founded this church. The Advent movement, and that's what it was, it was a movement that once, you know, Bible started getting in the hands of people, the, you know, late 1830s and 1840s, that's when you have the American Bible Society sprung up, people started reading really for the first time Daniel and Revelation on their own, and they, you know, they were all in all kinds of different churches. There, there was no Seventh-day Adventist church. There, there, there wasn't. So it's just people reading their Bibles, reading Daniel, reading Revelation, and going, I, I think the Lord's coming is soon. I, I think it's real soon. And, and, and it reminds me similar to Martin Luther, you know, the whole Reformation. Martin Luther didn't set out to start a denomination called Luther, Lutherans, right? I mean, I don't think that was his end goal when he put the 95 Thesis on the church door of Wittenberg, and the last one's like, and start a church in my name and call it Lutherans. <laughs> that, that was never his goal. His goal was to reform the church, to let the church see some things where they were dropping the ball on, and to, you know, refocus themselves on God, His love, His mercy, His grace, and His return, even. And so... We're, we're sitting in a church that has become a denomination, but to be an Adventist, you don't have to be sitting in a Seventh-day Adventist church. To be an Adventist means that you're looking forward to the second coming of Christ. That's what Advent means. And so the question we have to ask ourselves today, or we will be asking ourselves, I don't necessarily have to, but I'm posing it to you, and I hope you reflect upon it, is if you were accused of being an Adventist, in pretty much every Christian, whether Protestant or Catholic, should be an Adventist, right? right. That's right. Yeah. Is 
there enough evidence to convict you of that? Can the world, your co-workers, your family, your others, do they believe that you're an Adventist and are you professing that and showing that in your daily walk and interactions? Flip with me, because no sermon would be a sermon unless you at least open the Bible, or shouldn't be a sermon unless you open the Bible, I should say. Um, we, we touched on it, Matthew 24, 36 and 37. Talks about in the days of Noah. I think we, we probably have heard those verses before. And we're going to pick up the couple verses after. Yeah. Marlene read for us 36 and 37. It says, well, what were they doing in the days of Noah? And verse 38 says, For in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them away, so that also will the, son, or the coming of the Son of Man be. So, eating, drinking, marrying... Those are not bad things, right? We all got to eat. We all got to drink. Marriage is not bad. I'm definitely blessed. Our our text group of Gil and Five, with then, you know, Melanie and I and our three kids got expanded. Now it's the Gil and Six, you know, in our text group. So, um, and and our, like I said, our, our new daughter, All Live, has been a, a welcome blessing, you know, to our family. So, Marriage in and of itself, not bad, right? None of those things bad in and of themselves. But we're going to talk more about what can make them bad. You know, and, and is it where that becomes more of our focus maybe than some other things that we should be focusing on? A another verse that I would like for us to look at is in Luke um, chapter 14. Supper. And we're in Luke chapter 14, verse 16. And he, he, actually, verse 15 said, One of those that sat at the, the table with him heard these things, and he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper, invited many. And he sent the servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for things are now ready. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask that you have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask that you have me excused. And still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame and the blind. Does any of that resonate with any of us? Do we let other things preoccupy our time and our mind to where then maybe we're not doing as much as we could to be prepared? I'll, I'll, I'll give you a personal example. I think most of you have heard me say, or, or heard Melanie say, my wife has Huntington's disease. It's a rare disease, it's a neuromuscular, um, it, it's a progression where Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS is like a three year progression, kind of start to finish. Huntington's is more like a 10 to 25 year. Um, typically onsets between ages 30 and 50 and then you, you progress to it. So just in 1993 did they come up with a test to be able to identify people that had the Huntington gene and the ability then to know whether or not you're you know, going to be gene positive and you will manifest the symptoms. You don't know exactly when, but you know it will. So in 1997, my wife, being a therapist, noticed that her mother walking was different. 
she called it gate patterns. She, you know, she was like, you notice my mom's gate? I'm like, she don't have a gate. <laughs> <laughs> she lives in an apartment. No, you know, G-A-I-T. You work in healthcare, you should know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, oh, I don't really talk in therapy terms per se, day in and day out, but now I really never pay attention to your mom off, I can honestly say. She goes, well, her behavior's different too. And I'm like, I have to take your word again on that. Because I, at this juncture, my wife and I had only gotten married in 94. So this is only about three years. You know, we really, you know, I knew Pat, but I didn't really know Pat, you know, uh, enough to where I could, like, oh, yeah, she's acting totally different. Right. She's acting the same. She's always acting, as far as I can remember. Um, so in 97, when we couldn't, Get an explanation with Dr. Melanie just kept delving, 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 and finally said, I, I think it's honey. I think, you know, we need to take a to a neurologist. Did, blood work, came back, positive for Huntington's. Then we're posed with the question, what well, do we want to know? Would you want to know if you had a fatal disease? You know, so we grappled with that. We'd already had our first daughter. Our family had already started. And so... We're, you know, praying about, discussing it, you know, so we elected, you know, to um, be tested. Unfortunately, my wife and her sister both tested positive. It's a 50-50 chance, you know, so both came up, you know, where positive. So from that point on in our life, we started making changes in how we viewed life. So we were now given information that impacted the rest of all. And some of it in a good way. The good, I would say, because I would rather stress the good and not the bad. The good being, I'm the type of person working in finance, I would push stuff off till later. If there was something to buy or something to do, I would be like, let's wait. Later we'll build for that more. Let's, let's wait, let's wait, let's wait. Well, knowing that our gold years aren't going to be that golden, we do stuff like go to Antigua, on our 30th wedding anniversary while we still can. <laughs> mm. 10 years from today for our, you know, our 40th may not. I don't know. We shouldn't have to have a rock hanging over your head to live life to the fullest regardless. So I would encourage all of you, so regardless of what your circumstance may or may not be, don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today. God intends for us to enjoy ourselves in this life. Yeah. But ultimately where I'm coming back with this then is then we got into thought, Melanie was thinking about going back to school to become, you know, um, an occupational therapist, not just an assistant. And that would have been more schooling. And then we're like, well, you're only going to probably be able to work this long. And for the cost to be able to do that and time away from your family, the return on that investment is probably not there. So it doesn't make financial sense to make that decision. We were then a few years later building a house. We designed the house, wider you know, steps, all first level, all, all stuff that we knew that if we were going to be there that you know, it would make it more convenient, easy. When we relocated here, part of what brought us to Harrison and not in Batesville is that we couldn't find a house with the master suite on the first floor. All the master suites were on the second floor. Like that's not good for us. Got be on the first floor, you know. Um, so, and then even expanding our family was a, a, a big dis discussion at the time. It's like, well, if you know this and you know that each child could or could not, do you quit having kids now that you know or don't know? And and we grappled with that a while. Um, Cole would be happy to know that we opted for the side, Lord. If you want us to have more kids. We'll leave it up to you because we had challenges. At, believe it or not, most people of our generation and even younger have considerable fertility issues. I did a lot of research. I'm one of those kind of people. Once I know something, I research something. And, and so when we were having trouble, then I started researching and come to find out just about everybody about my age, you know, mid 50, you know, 30 years ago. You know, ago about one in two couples would have fertility issues. And they attributed a lot of it to plastic. Plastic mm -hmm. water bottles, plastic Gatorade, plastic, you know, like 
the, the chemicals in, in, in our killing male testosterone and whatnot. And so there was, you know, so I did a lot of studies on that, you know, did um, also, you know, just, there's other environmental factors, some of it even going back to Agent Orange, you know, you got lots of stuff, you know, just a lot of chemicals are working against us. So, so some estimates we're seeing a decline in teenage pregnancy. It's not for the lack of trying. It's, 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 for, the, it's for the you know the uh, the ability you know for fertility to occur. So if if you know as people then start to look at starting families, it's not just as easy as like well you know birds and bees. Like no, nah, it's far more complicated than that. It's far more complicated. So so because we had the two drugs and had to take charts and had to do all the kind of stuff that just kind of takes the fun out of the moment. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, Lord, since it was such an obstacle to have the first kid, if you want us to have any more, we're going to leave it in your hands. Um, and he, he did. He blessed us with two more children. And so uh, I, I can't thank him enough, you know, for that. But, my, again, where I'm coming back to is there was intentionality in pretty much every decision that we made from that time that we were told that Melanie was gene positive to this day and continues to impact our life. <sighs> Everything is viewed through that lens. We try to manage it so it doesn't manage us, and that's important. Um, but so the same thing now, let's apply this to what we just had read here in the days of Matthew and then this this, par you know, this parable of the Great Supper where people say, oh, I'm busy doing this, I'm busy doing that, I'm, you know. Is there enough evidence, <laughs> if you're accused of being an Adventist, that you could be convicted of? Are you making decisions, living your life in such a way that that is a factor in that process. I pause for dramatic <laughs> reflection. <laughs> yeah. And you don't have to answer this question, but I want you to I want you to play this question in your head, you know, the remainder of the day, week, ever how long you want to. So what have you done in the past year, two years, five years, pick, pick whatever time frame, but in particular just say a year. What have you done in the past year that shows that you're looking for the second coming of Christ? And that you're living in a way that you expect Christ to return and you're not thinking, of, well, God, I'll get to that later. I, I used to have the thought process when I first came back to the church after, you know, kind of doing what most people in college and whatnot do. I was like, man, thief on the cross, that's my guy. That's my guy. Death, bed, and Yeah. Let, let, let me squeeze every ounce of juice out of this world that I can get and let me just slide underneath that gate as it's closing. Just, just let, just let me get it. And I thought that that was a great plan. You know, um, I'll get the best of both worlds, everything the world has to offer, and then you know, have a turn. Best of both worlds, right? Anybody else ever think that way? Am I the only one thinks that way? Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was a great plan for the longest time. I, I can even remember bargaining with God at a young age, saying, "Lord, you made me tall." You want me to play basketball. <laughs> you want me to have a scholarship, and you want me to make a living doing that. Well, he helped me get through school, you know. But the closest to the MBA I knew I'd ever get was my MBA. So I went on to graduate school. That you know. So, I, but there was a part of me that's like, well, what, you know, really going. I'm gonna be six foot seven and, and 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 not make money at playing basketball per se. Really, is, that, is this how this works out? You know, it's like, yeah, because it, you know, I, I was always me. That the, my relationship with the Lord has always been. I want to be in the front, you know, with the the sick one hand, making the path, and I'm like, come on, God, we're going this way now, you know. And, 
so many times God just has to grab me by the collar and just like, would you just get behind me for a moment? I can clear this with a whole lot less effort than what you're putting into it. But you have to believe it. And so just like we believed the test results that we got back in 1997, even though, well, I'm going to say that. only been out for four years. Could have been flawed. I mean, we didn't, you know, but we took that to be truth. And then we started living our life that that was truth. So I'm posing to all of you, like, do you believe that Christ is returning? Do you believe that it's going to be soon? Then what are you doing in your life to show that, reflect that, prepare yourself? And so just like I asked the question of what have you done in the last year that would show that, the other reflective question I would pose to you is what are you going to start doing that you're not currently doing to prepare yourself, your family, your friends, you know, we was talking at Bible study Wednesday night that if you ever watch um, Walter, it, it's technically pronounced fight, like a fight. I heard one of his uh, videos, you know, it's, it's B-E-I-T-H, he's from South Africa. I've heard beef, bife, whatever, but I, in one of the videos, somebody had asked him that, and I was like, how do you say your last name? He goes, it's, it's actually fight, but whatever you call me is fine. It's kind of like my last name, Gilliland. I answer to a whole variable, you know, of, as long as it's close, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm responding. Um, but he had mentioned before he came to know the truth, he had worked with someone that was a Seventh-day Adventist for 19 years. And he never knew, he was an Adventist. And he hmm. never knew the person was an Adventist. <laughs> Makes me think, Sister White talks about when the Holy city New Jerusalem's coming down the voices we will hear are the ones that are aimed at us so you know there's millions there's multitudes there's people saying and, and she talks about you know how you will hear those voices of people saying Craig I worked with you why never did you tell me about that I was your neighbor you know for law, you know like those will be the voices that pierce us family members others how, how could you have known this? It's the pearl of great price, is it not? How could you have known this and not shared this? Well, I've got you know, rules at work. We don't talk about stuff like that, right? We don't, you know. And that's true. I mean, I, I don't, I, please don't take any of this to mean that I think we all need to leave out here T-shirts blazing saying, you know, the Lord's coming tomorrow. And, you know, um, <laughs> you know there, there is a, uh, you know, I always use the phrase, I don't mind being weird, but I don't want to be weirded. There you go. Yeah. Weird people kind of look at you and they'll go, eh, all right, nice. the there, give man, You know, like they won't dismiss me. If you cross that line and you go into weirdo, they're like, oh, man, just stay away from him. <laughs> I don't know what his agenda is, but it's just, it's, it's out there. So He's just crazy. avoid. Avoid, you know. So, but I'm probably not being weird enough. And, and, and so reflecting on this message today is like, I like to believe, and I can ramble off a few things the wife and I, you know, do and continue to do that um, try to prepare ourselves, but... Is everybody around us realizing why we're doing what we're doing and are we communicating as effectively we could? Maybe not. Could, could maybe be a little bit more um, covert than over. You know, and I think we could probably all agree with that, right? We're, we're all guilty of that. Um, but I'm 
mean, if you think about it, this church is named Seventh Day Adventist. Well, the Seventh Day piece, we got down, right? I mean, you, you can't have an interaction with somebody without getting that in the conversation. <laughs> We don't stress too much on that. And, and, and what's really ironic for you Bible historians, the Advent movement of the 1830s and 40s, you know, the church wasn't founded until 1863. And it was a Sunday-keeping church. It's the Advent movement, everybody was in other denominations, Methodist, Baptist, you know, Congregationalist, Catholic, you know, it wasn't until Rachel Oaks, who was a Seventh-day Baptist, said, you people are saying that you're studying the Bible and you're studying Daniel and Revelation and, and Sola Scriptura, and, and so why aren't you keeping the Sabbath? The group was like, oh. <laughs> they skipped that part. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so in the beginning, it was the Advent message that got the world on fire that everybody was talking about, and that's what brought them, you know, together. It wasn't the seventh day piece. The seventh day was a tackle. And now we find ourselves stressing that and not that. Well, that's what everybody asks about. Because, because that's what people can see a difference. Yeah. Well, they, they see church Saturday want. That's what they always ask. That's what they yeah. Yeah. So then that poses back to us. Do they not see the Advent part within us to ask about? They see the seventh day part because that's a more of a tangible, right? Yeah. Right. My neighbors see me dressed up every Saturday morning and leaving. Like, where are they going? Yeah. They can't have a funeral every Saturday. Right, right. <laughs> where that Saturday go to the grocery? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I mean, like, they don't know, but the ones closest to me know that my phone knows. As soon as I get in the car, you know, it's 10 minutes to the Harrison Church, which that always kind of amazes me, too. I mean, it's, I don't think for a moment our phone's in tracks. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, like, you know. Tracks, I don't have that turned on. You better turn that off. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is. with that stuff. Or yeah. to tell you, oh, did you have a good time at the ice cream parlor? I was not at the ice cream parlor. I may have been around there. That's because you got your locator on. I get that. Turn your locator <laughs> off. Yeah, I, I, I got know locator that. Turned I'm just off, saying. I'm still. Big, but I mean, I'm still stumped about how much it knows. <laughs> yeah. Which is, I just read something in our time that you, um, your latest iPhone has journaling turned on so that other people can read. What you're doing if they're in proximity to you. See. So that's, you want to turn the journaling function off creepy. under your settings wow. so that yeah. it's designed so that you can share thoughts and you know yeah. ideas and stuff and collaborate together. It's like So it's gonna say I'm gonna kill you. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking to collaborate with <laughs> even though I was in the Miami airport far longer I wanted to, I didn't want to collaborate with everybody there. <laughs> 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 oh, I got an yeah. So, oh, it still does it. <laughs> yeah, it still does My phone's, if it starts talking to me, it's getting out. <laughs> the, it's possessed. Yeah. <laughs> the last kind of somewhat thought along these lines I would leave you with, and the Portsmouth Church in um, the early 2000s needed... It was very similar to this church, actually, even the pews is the same color. I mean, there's just a lot of similarities. Um, fellowship halls in the basement, congregation getting older, people couldn't always get there, you know, so needed to either put in a lift, an elevator, or build a new fellowship hall on ground level. And, and so a lot of discussion for a lot of, and that discussion had been going on for years, finally came to a head. And we're like, do we buy the house across the street, tear it down, make a parking lot, build a new fellowship hall, you know, go, go to that expense. And this was going to be, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the, the thing, myself as one of the elders and a couple of other elders and the pastor at the time was all like, is this the best use of resources if we think the Lord is coming soon? 
So this is you know the, where the rubber meets the road, and, and and these are the kind of questions that then we individually as a church will continue to grapple with. You know, it's like should we be spending money this way, or should we be spending money some other way? Because what's a fellowship hall if the Lord comes next year? You know, kind of a thought process. You know, then. And I get the word out first. You know, you know, is that you know quarter million dollar plus better spent doing this versus doing that? You know. Um, and I don't necessarily have all the answers here, please. So don't don't take anything that I'm saying to you know other than. But hopefully these thoughts are starting to go through your mind when you're looking at purchases, decisions, other stuff. You know, is this you know getting us closer prepared? The church at Portsmouth ended up deciding that the fellowship hall had more pros than cons to it, and if we believed that the Lord would bless it, then he would replenish. And I can tell you, he did. But that church, no bigger pretty much than the size of this church, was able to raise and be debt free from the onset to, you know, come up with over a quarter million dollars to buy a house for, you know, 130000 and then just tear it down. Yeah, you know, to make it the parking lot so that the parking lot that was up by the church could be the fellowship hall. Um, Went, you know, went through all that, and, and 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 so you also have to believe. So to me, that was definitely a, a, a witnessing a God will bless your endeavors. The cattle on a thousand hills are His. All resources are His. So if you align your will with His will, you don't have to worry about what we typically worry about, right? And so as you grapple then in this upcoming year, years, what to do, what not to do. Prayer for, I mean, there was a lot of prayer. There was a lot of prayer that went into that decision. How should we spend these months? What, you know, what should we do? Fortunately, like I said, that's enough in the rearview mirror that I can share the success story and I can see how God definitely led. And that just further strengthened my own, obviously, spiritual walk to see you know, the Lord, you know, blessed in such a way that it did not make sense because the congregation was predominantly retirees. I mean, there wasn't that many people that were still, you know, working at a point that could um, contribute to that level. Uh, so, as we conclude our thoughts, I, that's, that's really what I want to leave you with, is that marriage is not bad, eating and drinking not bad, you know, buying land, you know, all the, th the excuses that were given there in Luke. Not bad, right? But we also can't let those become so much of our focus that we push God to the side that we don't even realize we've been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because this great, you know, supper is really, you know, analogous to Christ's return in the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know, so we all have an invitation to that. We all have the ability to sit at that table. Or are we saying, well, I got this, this, and this, and this. Are we giving up our seat at that banquet hall because of the cares of this world? Hmm. So, I would just encourage all of us, myself definitely included as well, as like, what do we need to be doing to better prepare ourselves for Christ's return, and not only ourselves, but all those we come in contact with. How can they sense and know of, you may be the only interaction some people that you come in contact with will ever have to hear about Christ's return. As, as populated as this world is, as interactive and social media and everything else, there's still, well, I, I tell my kids this all the time, they know everybody, but they know nobody. They, they, they may follow them, they may have all kinds of contacts, but then I'm like, if you talk to that person, would, would you get, oh no, that's awful, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> you yeah, yeah. <coughs> So having... Some more poignant conversations, and that's where you definitely want to pray, have the Holy Spirit help you 
and how to come across that. No, nobody likes being beat on the head, you know. So I would not advise you to use this as a tool to, you know, uh, it, it, it's it's love. It, it's love. Jesus loves humanity so much that he wants them to have a seat at that table and be a part of it. They, they have to know and hear that before they hear anything else. That he loves them so much right. that he was willing, as we know from John 3.16, you know, come down here and, you know, be sacrificed as we're, getting, as we're leading into the Easter season. You know, all that is what they need to know and hear. Um, so that then they're like, man, I, I want to sit at that table with him. I, I, I want to be prepared. We're the only place that you can find hope in this world. You ever thought about that? We are hope seldom. Where else can you find hope in this world? Can't get it on Amazon. Can't get it at Walmart, right? They're not selling hope. Google? Nope. Nope. I, I mean, look at all the depression and angst. The number one medication that every hospital I've been at for our the employees, antidepressant. I was on a school board for 20 years. The school nurse has just turned into a social worker, into a counselor, and so many kids are on antidepressant mm -hmm. medication. Yeah, with that, with that said, though, I was in an accident, and I had a real bad injury and everything. And first coming out of the accident, they're like, oh, you're the problem. Am I? I, I, I? I just went along with it. They prescribed me antidepressants. All right, I just did what I was told, but you know what? I don't take this. Because I'm not depressed. And I definitely do not want to diminish. There is a need, and people need to utilize that. So I would not diminish that. Mental health is real, right. and people need that. But what I'm saying is <clears throat> there are so many people that don't have hope that leads to depression. Right. Right. That's, that's the piece that we have something that you can't get anyplace else, and that is hope. We can help share hope to where somebody can see that this world is but a short time. It's but a vape. Don't don't sell out for this when you're giving up this. You know, eternity is far greater than whatever time we spend here on earth. And and, and again, I hate to you know keep you know mention my wife's condition, but I my wife compared to other people I see is so much different, so much different than her sister, unfortunately. And her sister's younger than her, but her sister's far more progressed than. And so much of it is because of my wife's faith. Of course, you know, diet, exercise, other things as well. But if you have hope, you can still stay positive even when you have bad news yeah. in front of you. If you think that this world is all there is, well, how could you not be depressed? How could any of us not be depressed, right? But if you have a stronger faith than that, then you're like, you know, we're on borrowed time anyway. So, should, shouldn't, you know, um, get to, I mean, as you've already figured out, my wife is a whole lot more positive, happier person than I am. She's, I'm married up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, she was on a first name basis, and everybody at the resort seemed like before we left, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta got catch a ride back to the airport, huh? I mean, you gotta speed up the goodbyes. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it's like, I got right? Yeah, I mean, but that comes. Your wife from, is just a friendly, friendly person. Just you know, yeah. speaks <laughs> speaks to everybody. Yeah. But you know, and I'm like, you know, I could, you know, me and my wife are out, and she just. She just starts speaking to everybody. I was like, do you know that person? She was like, no, I'm just speaking. I said, do you know that person? You know, it don't matter who it hi. doesn't matter who it is. And, you know, and then I start teasing. I was like, you know that guy? You know that guy? <laughs> you know, but um, going back to what you said, I just watched something on YouTube last night. I mean, and you really just hit something that's really important. I mean, what makes being a Seventh-day Adventist so great? is that we have the truth. 
That's what makes it great. Not the name, it's what we have. And it is the truth. And when you know the truth, then you have to be able, the dangerous thing about being an Adventist is, is that you have to be able to balance the Daniel and the Revelation, is what this guy said last night, and the hope and the love that Jesus gives. You have to be able to combine them both together because if you just go this way with, you know, Revelation and this, that, and other, you're like, oh my God, you know. But then if you don't if you don't bring it full circle and say, you know, this is what Christ came to earth for, to, to die for us because he loved us. And if you don't combine it all together, then you, you won't get it. You miss something. Or some people were having a hard time to say, well, what am I living for? You know, I mean, you have to bring it full circle for you, for people to understand. And so when you're talking to people, when they're hurting, you know, you don't want to be like, oh, yeah. You know, you want to be like, hey, man, what can I do for you? Yeah. What, really? Oh, yeah, well, you know, what do you need? What, you know, can I do this? Can I do that? Because that's what they're going to remember. They're not going to remember, oh, yeah, all you said was that, you know, hell's fire and, you know, ding. nobody want to hear that. You have to be able to bring it all together if you want somebody to, to, to say, oh, yeah, you know, I know about that. Yeah, I know about that Adventist over there. Yeah. To conclude with one last exercise, you could partake of it, you, you could not. My son will be able to speak more of this because now he's entered into the financial advising field. So if you need a financial advisor, lose your shameless plug. Um, <laughs> but everybody, everybody should have, you should have on an index card, you know, like what is your goals? Financial. You know, is it to retire at a certain date? Is it to buy a home? Is it, you know, like list your four or five key goals. And then every time an important decision comes up in your life, you pull out that index card and you ask yourself, will this get me closer? or farther from my goals. And that will give you the clarity that you need when you're confronted with, do I upgrade the car, do I move, do I this, do I that, do I subscribe to this, do I do that? Every, you know, larger purchase decision you look at and relative to that. And, and, and so I would say we take that same kind of model and say, if we believe in Christ's return, and that's on our index card, and we think it's going to be soon, then all the major decisions in our life, we've got to ask ourselves, is this getting me closer or further from that goal? Let's conclude with prayer. Heavenly Father, we just so think we get to call you Father. I mean, we, we don't deserve it. I mean, we, we, we fail daily. Um, but we just are thankful, Lord, that you're still there, you're still listening, you pick us right back up, and you still love us, and you have made that abundantly clear in your word, and we just, you know, claim those promises, Lord. And we're thankful for the love that we feel not only within this room, but all around the world, within all your, your children, Lord, of many faiths, many different walks, and we would just pray that, regardless of where they're at, that we would grab back a hold of that movement, that Advent movement to where we get excited about your return. We start thinking in those terms, and we start looking and planning our lives in such a way that others can kind of sense and feel that. Help us, Lord, rein us back in when we start to become weirdo. I, I do pray that. You know, keep us weird, keep us peculiar, as Peter says. You, know, you have a peculiar people. That's fine. We want to be peculiar. We want people to ask questions like, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? That's, that's great lead-ins. <laughs> Help that to do that more, Lord, in our upcoming days and months. And just, just guide and direct us in a way that we can be prepared and we can get others prepared and that we can be ready for that married supper of the Lamb, sit down at that banquet and spend eternity with you. Help that be the focus. Help that be the thing that we concentrate on. Help us to sell hope to people that need hope because there's just a lot of despair out there. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I have no idea what our closing song is, but... Uh, I can tell you. It is... It is uh, 272. Give me the Bible. 272.
closing song, 272, please stand. <laughs>